I want to welcome you all here and thank you for coming. I'm Jerry Hyman, longtime Platte Lake resident and history digger for the Bens Area Historical Museum. And I love to dig up stories. And the, the history of Platte Lake is full of stories, as you'll see. This talk is more about the stories than anything else. For those of you wondering about the technical aspects, uh, I want to introduce Larry White, who doesn't live on Platte Lake. He, he wishes he did, but he's actually on Crystal Lake. Right now, I'm sure he'd rather come swimming in Platte Lake. <laughs> uh, Larry is um, the uh, vice president of the board at the Historical Museum and, and our technical guru for all things of this sort. He does all the Benzoni Academy lecture series, uh, Zoom and recording, which you should come to frequently on the third, second or third Thursday of each month. Of third, uh, yeah, right here. Great, great programs Thank come. Um, so this is going to be recorded if you want to go back and see it later or your friends do and it's going to be on the youtube channel of the benzie area historical society and there will be a link on our pli web page to the historical society so you can uh, see it as many times as you want it's being zoomed live right now and we have quite a few people 23 23 folks that were too lazy to come here tonight are watching it right now in their underwear at home. I originally put this together many years ago for the Historical Museum and then used it as a uh, awareness uh, benefit for the Platte Lake Improvement Association members a few years after that. I've tweaked it a little since then, so if some of you saw it before, there may be some new stuff that we've discovered along the way. So with that, I'm going to get into it. First, a word from our sponsor. I assume most of you here are members. I'm hoping a few of you aren't because we kind of put the word out to try and get some people on the lake that weren't members so that we can tell them how important it is that they become members. The Platte Lake Improvement Association, we're going to see people here tonight going back to 1900. We're standing on their shoulders to keep this lake alive, keep it going in good condition. All the riparians that live on the lake take a part in that, obviously. But we only have about 55% of the people that live on the lake as members. It's always been that way. It's better than it has been because of our new heavy-duty PR and social media campaigns. But still, there's a lot of people riding free. And if you know any of them, sign them up. They got to do their part to keep your lake the way you want it and their lake. So with that, we'll get to these pioneers that started the resort business on this lake. I'm not, it's not part of the resort business, but people are asking me about the Edgewater Mill. So I've just got a quickie little bit on that. Uh, started about 18, uh, 1887 by uh, Chicago lumber outfit that sent John Little up with his two sons to build a mill on the Platte Lake because they had acquired timber leases to all the hemlock and maple around the hills surrounding Platte Lake and they wanted to mill it, ship the lumber down to Chicago. So the mill got started. Oops, got to go back. Um, let me go on. Okay, I'm going to do the rest of the contents. <laughs> the uh, then we're going to do some of the resort hotels. 
and uh, then this one now, uh, where am I? Come a little back, the mill, resort hotels. All right, let me get to Edgewater. First, I wanna show you this slide, cause this before Edgewater in that general area, I like to think this was what it looked like, but I have no proof that this is really Platt Lake, but it kind of looks like where Herman Botts would have had his farm with a two track he cut in off of the Lake Michigan Shore Road to homestead this free property looking kind of toward the mouth. But when I look at it critically, I'm not sure it is the mouth. But it would look like that. This is what was on Platte Lake at the time. The Edgewater Mill came along. They built the mill, of course. You see all those rain barrels on the roof to, to uh, put out fires, but it never worked because every mill I know burned down at least once. It was uh, right over in that corner up there where the exit is. You see Edgewater Drive. That was the mill. I think the mill probably stood right about where Dave Furhoff's house is. But there's no trace of it except a bunch of slab boards out in the lake uh, from the end cuts that they made. You can still see the saw marks on those boards. Here's another angle and you see they're just lumber logs everywhere. Here's the crew, the lady with the dishpan and kind of in the middle, that's Ralph Amadon's mother. And Ralph Hap Amadon later started the Water Wheel Resort. This is a view of the lake, nothing but logs everywhere. Those walkways the guys are standing on, the pilings for those were still sticking up until recent years, just enough to catch the bottom of your outboard. Um, but now they're all laid over. And that steamboat out there was the Mud Hen, a very trouble plagued boat they used to haul the logs of raft, the rafts of logs across the lake from one end of the lake to the mill. But it was always running aground, springing leaks, and it was a it was a cursed boat. This is the railroad narrow gauge that they built from the mill to Lake Michigan, and you can still walk or ski the grade. Uh, the nothing left of the railroad, but the grade's still there, and a lot of people have buckets of uh, spikes and various other metal objects at their house that they've picked up through the years. And this was the famous engine that's supposedly in the bottom of the lake. I, we still get inquiries from around the country about the, the engine in Platte Lake. Well, if there was an engine run into the lake when the mill closed, it would have been this box car, which has a steam engine in the middle of it. And that was brought over from the old ironworks in Alberta when it closed. And that was what hauled the cars of finished cut lumber down to the ship. So it, if that was in the lake, it would just be a pile of boards and there should be a steam boiler there somewhere, but no one's ever found it that I know about. Here's the dock they had down at the end of that uh, grade and a boat, a lumber hooker tied up, taking on a load of boards. They had a post office in the, a corner of the company store. Uh, they had about 200 people at its peak living there, working there, even at a schoolhouse. The schoolhouse lasted longer than anything else. It ran until about 1920. The mill burned in 1903. The timber was kind of played out, the old story, and they didn't rebuild it. But the schoolhouse functioned as one of the county's little uh, one-room schools, of which there were many until 1920. The schoolhouse, we don't know where it went, but part of it might be part of Tom Rumney's cat, uh, 
cottage. They think they think it is, and I looked at it. Eh, it could be. Then along came Camp Wallace in about 1920 which was actually the property just adjacent to Edgewater. It wasn't the Edgewater property itself, the Mills property, but it was next to it. This was the Highland Park school systems camp to get the kids out of the dirty, hot city in the summer, send them to camp. And it was just tents on platforms uh, after the camp closed, the school system sold off those lots. So when you drive along Edgewater Drive, all those houses there were originally sold to teachers in the Highland Park school system. There was a girls camp, obviously separated by quite a bit from the boys camp. It was down the lake, right where uh, uh, Debina Gibb Potts place is. Uh, she showed me her dad, Jack, had cemented over when he in his workshop. There's a bunch of holes in the concrete floor where the toilets were, and uh, so that was Camp Wasikwam, the girls' camp. All right. So the resorters. I have to throw this in. I just got this from Jim Marcio's postcard collection. And I, it was amazing because it's a picture of my cottage just before I bought it. And, and you know, it looked really good in the real estate ads. I mean, they took some really great pictures. But when I got here, this is this is my neighbor, you know, and saw what I'd bought, it was not such a good bargain. I'm pulling your leg. This this is actually a postcard that says Uncle F the Hermit of Platte Lake. Does anyone know about Uncle F? This, this guy got a postcard made of it. The postcard isn't dated. It's not postmarked. Don't know when it was, but it was in his collection that he bought. One. And I said, my God, someone around this lake has to know about the legend of Uncle F. So keep your ears open. If you hear anything about Uncle F from your old uh, relatives that were here back in the day, uh, legends, stories, call me. A lot of the, what I'm going to uh, refer to came from this article that I was given by Howard Ingleston years ago, uh, the copy of it, uh, an article written by F. Uh, Brown from New York City in 1901 for the American Sportsman magazine. And it was, it's an accounting of his two-week trip to Platte Lake, staying at Thompson's Platte Lake Hotel, 1901. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time uh, reading it all. We don't have time, but I'll, I'll read a bit at the end. And um, it really gives you a picture of what it was like to come here and stay at one of the fishing hotels in 1901. And uh, getting here, obviously, was a chore. And getting to the hotel, even more of a chore. I'll just give you a little sampling here about um, his, uh, when he got met at the station. Here we go. He stopped at Beulah Station meet Thompson's bus, a comfortable open wagon with side seats and lumpy hay cushions, start at a snail's pace around the east end of exquisite Crystal Lake, and go up a long hill where the road is all deep sand and the horses stop every few hundred feet. It takes two hours to plod the four miles from the station to the Platte Lake Hotel. But when the highest hill is reached, Sand vanishes, we go down the hill into the refreshing wild forest, cross two trout rivulets, I don't know what happened to those, and arrive at Thompson's Hotel. So no easy task getting there. Usually they had to walk going up the hill. And the reason that he was 
peak to come there was a picture in a previous issue of Dr. Baker from Findlay, Ohio, who had been a guest at that hotel, holding this fine muscalunge. And, uh, and, a, and a description he gave of the royal battle with that fish. And Mr. Brown was hooked and he just had to come to the Platte Lake Hotel. Then there was also a group of people, resorters, not at a resort hotel, from Pemberville area, uh, or from Pepperville and around the area of Ohio. And they started coming around 1903, 1900, and camping on this farmer's pasture down by the lake. And the farmer was, uh, Farmer Brown, had to be Farmer Brown, but eventually was uh, replaced by Joe Vinson, who some of you may have talked to, uh, who I think married Brown's daughter. It's the only connection I can make. Well, and they, hey, can we camp on your property? Yeah, sure. Watch out for the cows. They'll come through going back and forth to the lake, you know. And then after two or three years of that hauling canvas, they'd say, could you build us a, a little cabin there? And he'd say, oh, I got nothing to do in the winter. Sure, I can build you a cabin. And he'd build the next guy a cabin, this guy a cabin. So, and they were all white as the tents had been. So, white city. And all the people in there originally were all from that general area of Ohio. We have, I've just recently come upon these courtesy of, I wish I could remember her name, but on our Facebook page, uh, page put out, what was her name? What? Yeah, well, she was, she's a, a Hobart uh, descendant. And, and in response to Paige putting a picture on the Facebook page, she put a whole bunch of them on there with co uh, comments. I saw them and said, I got to have those. And Paige contacted her and you know, she said, sure. So I copied them. This is uh, the Hobart family camp in 1916. Uh, and it is a camp. This was their summer vacation coming up from Ohio. And they'd put up these huge canvas tents Here's another view. Let me tell you, that's a lot of canvas to put up. And that's what everyone did around the lake before they had cottages built. If they didn't stay in one of those hotels, they found a farmer with a pasture and said, can we put our tents up? And they do it year after year after year. Uh, this is taken from the Spitzer's dock, uh, looking west to the Hobart's family compound. And to carry all that, heavy canvas in there and ropes and stakes had to be a job. Then some of them, like somebody got some striped awnings for, this was called the Camp Three E's. I know one of them was Earl Hobart, who's stuck off, you can see his arm on the left. I don't know who the other E's are. Classic early 1900s pose. So anyway, I just got those pictures. Then there was a Detroit contingent, a couple of Detroit contingents. Uh, Warden's Resort was mostly full of Detroiters. We'll get to that resort later. And another one of the colonies like White City, Columbico, started through all these members of the choir and the clergy of the Central Presbyterian Church in Detroit, courtesy of the Reverend A. A. Amstutz the pastor, and uh, he, he and some friends came up about 1918, stayed at Thompson's Resort Hotel, and rode down the lake because someone said the farmer down there in the, at that end of the bay had a, lot of, a bunch of land he'd sell. They rode down to look at it. It was kind of swampy, but they figured, well, there's a ridge of high ground next to the lake. <clears throat> And they struck a deal and bought that whole shoreline from the farmer. And they went back to Detroit and platted it all. And each of the original families bought two lots and sold the other lots to members of the congregation. So there was the Curtises, the Amstutzes, the Berridges, and the Collars. 
Some of them are still here. And they, they celebrated their 100th anniversary a few years ago. Uh, and the, the, I don't have any pictures, unfortunately, of Columbico houses back then. I'm looking for some, if any of you people have them. But the, uh, I can tell you that the guy there was the Reverend Amstutz in his younger days with his family. Here in his older days with his son, Allison, and his daughter, Lolly. Um, and, and Allison was Al Amstutz's father. So those houses just kept getting passed down, and, uh, which was a common story. So how'd they get up here? Well, they could come by train after 1892 when it reached Beulah, and then get a farmer to haul you over the lake in his wagon. Uh, you could come by boat to Frankfurt, Northern Michigan Transportation Company, and get transportation to Platte Lake. Or you could come, if you were really gutsy, by auto. And uh, uh, Lolly and Pete Amstutz, I've, there's a recording where the family sat them down and made them reminisce about their youth, about coming up from Detroit in their big Overland touring car. It was a big family. And they'd get as far as Claire, Mary, and the first night camp in the churchyard. Yeah, he was a minister. He could camp in any churchyard. They'd get up next morning, break camp, make it the rest of the way up here on the sand roads. And if you're going to do that, you probably were going to stay a while. And But then eventually, the guys would have to go back to work. The women would stay here with the kids. They had no car. And so the enterprising people like Weaver's Grocery and Honor would bring the, their grocery wagon or I'll make the rounds every week, take your order. And the next week they'd bring your order because the women didn't have any way to go anywhere. And then, so this is part of the problem of going by car. You gotta travel Eden Hill Road. It's still not a lot better than that. But most of the year, it's a little better. I have to take it every day. And they've been telling me since 1985 it was going to be paved any day now. <laughs> I ain't going to live to see it. And you might arrive at, you see these fine autos that made the trip to Thompson's Resort. Or you could go around the other end of the lake on Deadstream Road. There's Deadstream Road. And that was probably late 30s, early 40s from that car. And you'd finally arrive at your cottage. This is the Faust family from Detroit, having arrived at their cottage in their old cruiser with all their stuff and the kids. You know this scene very well. You, you've all lived this scene many times. <laughs> Are we there yet? Um, two, two. So, what did they do when they got here? Well, we know because they wrote postcards home like crazy. Everyone wrote postcards. And thank goodness we have some people that are postcard collectors. And when you collect postcards, you see what's on the back of them. And so, a couple of the collectors, Mary Sentlever and uh, Beverly Wilcox, gave me some of theirs to copy. And I took out some gems. So 1955, went partway up the river yesterday. The river is filled with trout, for which we have no license. Um, 1936, here a picture of our fine place among the pines. Wish you were here. Fishing not so hot, boating okay. And 1949 at Gidley's Resort. Hi kid, how's everything? Ed has gone to Traverse City to get a tooth pulled. I'm okay. Weather fine. 1945, dear Bert and Bess, if I had known the weather was going to be so grand, I would have urged you to come up with us. We're enjoying every minute. Get up late, retire early, and eat like pigs. 1910, dear brother, I got your letter and will answer you. For don't think I've forgotten you. Well, I will say goodbye, Wesley. 
That's what I was right. And 1913 at Ingleston's Resort. This one I like. Stayed on Crystal Lake for three days. Fishing was poor and the eating worse. Came up to Platte Lake, which is about four miles from Beulah. We have fine meals. Fishing is good, and we're enjoying ourselves very much. Ike. So there, take that. Here's an unknown date. Dear Ernest and Lottie, reached the cottage Sunday at 1.30 p.m. Mother seemed comfortable after the drive. Caught a small but fighting muskrat. Killed a three-foot snake Monday and ran from a four-foot snake Tuesday. Place seems full of snakes and leeches. <laughs> they won't be going back there. And then the one I like the best, I'm not sure of the date, but it was early 1900s. When I'm not home or at school, I'm here. A little prairie flower growing wilder by the hour. <laughs> Whitsy. It turns out that uh, was a, like a great aunt to uh, Linda Patterson. <laughs> I showed her the postcard. She said, yeah, she would have been that way. <laughs> So that's what we know. Anyway, we know from all these postcards and from the writings that people did that what they did was they fished. Man, did they fish. Every morning, everyone went out and they fished. And they, then they'd take a picture of their fish. Somebody would clean them, I assume. In the afternoons, after lunch, they swam and they boated. Mostly they swam. But every day they'd go out in the morning and they'd fish. Women fish too, not easy in those long dresses, but they did. This was at Thompson's Resort. And here's the grand champion fisher. Huh? <laughs> this was at the American Resort. <laughs> I don't know if these came out of Big Platte or Little Platte, but can you imagine how long it took to arrange all those for the picture? Just to get all the sizes right, you know? It'd be, it'd be hours arranging your fish for the picture. <laughs> and after fishing, they'd go boating. This is the Spitzer family in White City. And that boat house you see there uh, belonged to the uh, Wilcox's house, which was right, right by there. They sailed. This I want you to know. I have talked to both of these people. I know both of these people. The guy with the cool looking cigarette dangling as Bob Kirkland, who just died very recently, uh, the house is in White City. And the gorgeous girl is Betty Wilcox, who still uh, has her place up here. Uh, I talked to her about two summers ago, and uh, she's, not, she's 98 now, and still looking good and sharp as a tack, but getting a little trouble getting around and don't know if she's going to get up here this summer or not, but her place is just down the road a little bit from me. And uh, Betty was the uh, supreme catch for anyone around the lake in those days. Any of the young guys, they wanted to go out with Betty, and you can see why. Although her dad was not easy to get past. <laughs> so I'm told. Or you could, oops, I missed that one. Or you could uh, wash your car for the Saturday night dance. You just dive it in the lake. Try that on your Toyota. <laughs> this, is, this is Frank Redding, and he decided that he'd clean his car. So he just drove it in the lake and had at it. I have not tried that. Uh, I'm not sure the DEQ would approve. And uh, but back then, yeah, you could do that, you know, that stuff, or you could go down the river and have half Amadon tow you back up in a string of boats at the end of the day with his motor launch. And people went on picnics, obviously. So when they came, the play I've, I've referred to these places before, but I'll give you a little more detail. There was Thompson's Flat Lake Hotel, which became Revnell's Resort in the 30s uh, for a brief time before it burned down. There was Ingleston's Resort, 
which as you might imagine is right at the end of Ingleston Road. Yeah. Well, I don't hear it good. Oh yeah, I'll tell you the location. Yeah, okay. Um, Thompson's Resort was right where Ingleston Road, Old Platte Road come together and come right into Platte, New Platte Road, right, right there at that juncture on the South Shore. Ingleston's Resort was obviously on Ingleston Road, right where it takes a sharp curve and uh, goes along the lake. Tim Krause's house was part of Ingleston's resort. Uh, so that was on the South Shore also. Warden's resort was right where the boat launch is. The Burke Hotel was where the Wilcox, the old Wilcox house is, the original Wilcox house. And I'll tell you about the Burke Hotel, but uh, I know it was a Homer is that I get Lumen and Homer mixed up. Was it Homer? Yeah, Homer. Homer came along at the right time after the Burke Hotel had burned down and he bought the property and, and had his house built there. Then there was some North Shore cottage resorts, but they were mostly small cabin type places, not the big multi room hotel. Um, and but there was one that I have just found out thanks to talking to Jim Marchio that sat right where he and Dave Johnson's houses are called the North Shore. It was very grand, the North Shore Inn and Hunting Club, something like that. It was, it was built in 1928 and burned down in 1932. So it had a short span, but it was the place to go party while it ran. It had 18 rooms upstairs. Uh, I don't have a picture of it, but if Jim ever finds the one he's got, I will. Um, and uh, But we've got some newspaper clippings about the fine civic parties they had there. So there was one big hotel, and I just found this out on the North Shore for a brief time. And then, so this is Thompson's. The original Thompson's Hotel in 1900, and then here's his ad. You can have a day's sport with Basser Pike. And this is Uncle Billy himself, born in Dublin, Ireland. And so he could spin a tail uh, and live to be 90. He ran that resort from about 1895 to 1931 when he had an accident and was in the hospital and had to have a leg amputated and wasn't getting around too good after that. So he sold it to the Revnell family and they had it for until it burned down in the mid thirties. Uh, this is, you can see in the distance, the long low building was the the newer building he built in 1912 after he had a fire in the original one you just saw. And that's the one that most people remember as Thompson's Resort. He had lots of boats. All the guests could go out and row all day trolling for muskies. There you see the long resort building in the corner and the dining hall, the old farmhouse in the center. There's the long resort building before it burned. And there's Uncle Billy in the near boat surrounded by a bunch of kids. The Revnells, this is the Revnell family that bought, that bought it for a dollar. I think she used to work for him or something. Uh, and their two kids, Bill and Jack. And Bill died not too long. Some of you knew Bill Revnell. Uh, I, I wish I, I wish I got to talk to him, but I never did. But yeah, he could have told me all about it. Then there was the cottage resort, better known as Ingleston's, that started in 1903 at Ingleston Road. Uh, this is a colorized picture of it. It was basically two houses right here uh, by the time they finished it. And there were five or six rooms upstairs in each of the houses, cook your meals downstairs, 
to have a boat. I happen to have a letter from Minnie Ingleston to a prospective client from the 1920s. In reply to your inquiry, where I'd say that our summer resort is three and a half miles from Beulah, the railroad station, 12 miles from Frankfurt, the boat landing. Boats and trains will be met when notified. Our house is 200 feet from the south shore of Platte Lake, which is one of a chain of lakes and rivers leading out to Lake Michigan. There are many beautiful auto and boat trips close to this place. Our rates are from $17.50 to $21 per week. Including, including board and room. Now, actually, my daughter-in-law today calculated what that would be today, and it was only like three hundred and twenty some dollars. So, it's still a bargain today for board and room. A dollar per day for rowboat, two dollars per day for boat and motor, including fuel. There are both speckled and rainbow trout in the nearby rivers, also large and smallmouth bass, muscalons, pickerel. Perch and bluegills in these lakes and nearby lakes. Splendid bathing, golf course near. Any further information will be cheerfully given. That was from Minnie Ingleston. And this is the two houses from the lake and the boats available. Yep, let me go back. And we have Ralph and Minnie Ingleston and their only child, Wayne who would have been father to the Wayne Ingleston that you know, and Phyllis Hennizer and Howard Ingleston. And uh, Ralph died fairly young because he never had a pipe out of his mouth and he died of oral cancer in 1926. Let that be a lesson to you. And so Minnie carried on with her mother, Eva Snyder, and a help from hired staff keeping the resort going for many years, up until like near 1950. They had a, a motor launch that they used to tow people back up the river that wanted to do the river trip thing. That This was a powerful looking boat. Uh, it, the flag there says Panther P. Phyllis, Hennizer told me that she was told that it was called that because you could use anything in that old uh, engine for fuel, <laughs> including, yeah, it's probably Panther P, I guess, but that's why they named it that. If you could find some, it would be really expensive. Uh, this was the boat at the dock with a huge searchlight or siren on the front. I'm not sure which. This was the staff and little Wayne in front of his mother. And this is a picture of Tom, uh, Uncle Billy Thompson and Ralph Ingleston together. It's a rare shot. Uncle Billy on the right and Ralph with his hands over his head. <laughs> they were competitors, but most of the year they were neighbors and friends. Warden's Resort built in 1910, log, a log place, about 15 rooms, uh, right where the boat launch now is. The land was homesteaded by Bill and Ermina Warden, and he built this resort. And if you came there and you drove a long, hard day from Detroit, and you got there in the evening, and came in the front door to be greeted by your smiling host, Bill, Bill and Ermina Warden, who've been waiting for you all day to show up. Hey, where the hell you been? They believe this is not a place where I would try to steal the towels. So that was Bill and Ermina. They only had one son, George, who helped run the resort. But George had a ton of kids, and those are the wardens that we knew uh, that I can't even reel off all their names, but there was uh, Wendell was uh, one who was the Scott warden's father. Scott has the interlock and boat shop, and he had a ton of aunts and uncles. But, uh, and this is a, a great picture of from the lakeside of the resort, and they had a pretty big boat too, you see. 
to tow people up from the river. And there it goes, uh, towing a string of boats. Uh, that's the old Platte River Bridge be uh, before the new one was put in, heading down the river. That's uh, George and I'm not sure who. But anyway, I got to tell you, it is a very confusing. Warden's Resort, uh, Bill Warden wasn't the greatest business guy. And I think he was kind of a anti-government, no, nah, I'm not paying taxes guy. And the story I got from his, uh, one of his granddaughters was he lost the place in the late 20s over taxes unpaid. And it was bought by, by coincidence, uh, Cap, they called him Cap. It was John Warden, a retired Hamtramck Ham police chief, bought the resort. And he ran it up until 1940. And so they talk about the Warden's Resort, but it was two different wardens not related. And uh, it's, uh, it confused me for a long time until I found an article that explained that. Anyway, one April night in, eight, in 1940, no one around, something caught on fire and it burned to the ground and was never rebuilt. And the land eventually reverted to the DNR for the boat launch. The Burke Hotel is an interesting story because it was apparently quite the place. You'll see, um, it, but it, it came up for sale in uh, 1916, I think this is, for the grand price of uh, offered for sale at $1,500, less than half what the hotel building alone cost. Sounds to me like a desperation sale. Might have been a divorce or something like that. Anyway, but apparently it wasn't selling because not long after that, 1916, Burke Hotel went up in smoke. Said they did have some insurance. So this was a little suspicious. But anyway, then when Homer Wilcox came along, that land was available and that's where he built the Wilcox beautiful cottage. The North Shore, you got Robinson's and Lewandowski's resort were next to each other. And I can't tell you exactly where they were, but I think it was uh, toward the east end, not way east, but kind of toward the east end from, from the middle. Someone might know, but uh, I don't have an exact spot. And, uh, but they, they rented the usual, they had gas, rented boats, motors, had cabins, that's what most of the North Shore resorts were. There's Robinson's, right on Dead Stream Road. And then there was, I did, I put this one because I love the picture. This is Cook's Resort. Uh, they, they had property on both lakes, between the lakes. And uh, this is Mom, Pa, Cook, I assume. Now, this is the ones I just got. The North Shore Inn and Hunting Lodge, open for business. Chicken, fish, and steak dinners by appointment. Parties and banquets solicited. Music. I mean, this was no ordinary fishing hotel. This was a resort. And um, the, uh, it was Fred Towers and June Towers were brought up in Chicago to run it when it was built. And they would kept, they stayed open in the fall and winter. And this is where all the local events were held for a while. Like what Crystal Mountain is now. Well, that was where you had them back then. This, talk, this talks about the annual party. Large number turn out to dine, dance, and play bridge. Host is complimented. But then, like all... It was destroyed by fire. This was 1932 or 33, and it burned to the ground. Now, I'm going to briefly talk about some of the houses, and then we'll get to some stories. People eventually wound up wanting to have their own place. You know, they, got, they didn't want to keep staying at the fishing hotel, or it burned out from under them. And, and they got tired of putting up canvas. And so they wanted a house. One of the earliest houses 
and it still looks exactly the same, it was the Fulton Ham Hunting and Fishing Club. You may know it as the Muskingum Club about, uh, well, it'd be on Old Platte Road on the South Shore. And you, you look at it from the lake and you can't miss it. Nothing else looks like it. Two-story, blue trim, white place. I've been in it. It's still just the same. The, the studs are there and the outside wall is the inside wall. If you want to hang up pots and pans, you just drive a nail in and immediately you got a hanger. I like that. You know, it, it's practical. And I can't do it. Well, I could do that in my house. It's a log house. But my wife never liked it much when I tried it. Um, so it was built in 1895 by railroad people from the Muskingum area of Ohio who all got free passage on the train. And so as the railroad was building toward the north, they kept every weekend or every month or so, they would get on the train and ride to the end of the line, look around and say, is this it? No, go back. So next week they go a little further, a little further. Finally, 1892, the railroad gets to Beulah. So they get out and say, this looks pretty good. Someone told them about Platte Lake. They got a ride with a farmer over the hill to Platte Lake and said, this is it. So they built about eight families, built that place. And it's still owned by a group of families that parcel out time for it. And there it is today. Then they have catalog houses. You've heard of those. Uh, there's Next to, you see the Fultonham Club there. The next two houses uh, are Montgomery Ward catalog houses. One of them was Tom Schoonover's uh, parents or grandparents, not sure which. And uh, Mary still lives there, but it doesn't look like this anymore. But the people did get catalog houses delivered. Some people had houses moved. This house here was moved for Bill Faust's grandfather. I uh, can't remember his first name, the original Mr. Faust. And I have copies of correspondence handwritten between him and George Minor. And George Minor was a farmer down on Platte Road toward the east end of the lake that owned a huge amount of property on the east end. And in fact, he eventually be, uh, wound up building all those cottages on what we now know as Miner's Bay. It's because George Miner built them. But he also was looking for other work to do. And so Mr. Faust and he were talking about moving this house from up on the hill, somewhere up above Honor, down to their lot in Columbico. And George Miner replied back that yes, he could, but it was a hard location. They'd have to uh get it down the hill and through the swamp and take it and cut it in half to take it over some bridges and it was going to cost like four hundred dollars to get it into the new spot but he said okay fine and so george minor moved it they put it back together into one piece and then here are the false shingling and what i really like about this is you'll notice mr faust leaning on the ladder Take, getting his picture taken, and Mrs. Faust is hammering tar paper. That's the kind of woman you want. Here's Miner's Bay. But most of those were built by, they call it Bay Point Resort, the area, but it was George Miner's cottages. Then I'm going to, the, the last section I'm going to do is uh, the New Philadelphia, Ohio people had a down by where Yukon is beyond Cedar Street, way toward the east end. There's a string of cottages there that were all in the Bowers and Bowslin families from New Philadelphia, Ohio. And the original uh, place, but built by Roy Bowers, a minister. There's always been a lot of ministers up here. I don't know, they're just everywhere. And a and couple of the other relatives that came up and built places later were ministers. But, and one guy was a lawyer, Muscle Bowers, a uh, nephew or something. And he had a son, Thad, who became a lawyer. 
And Thad was a wonderful writer. And in about 1945, he sat down and he typed his memories of his teenage years on Platte Lake in the summers. And he talks about everything you'd ever want to know. He talks about balky outboard motors and what they did about them. Talks about uh, his first encounter with girls down the lake and going to the movie house in Beulah and, and having her slide over next to him in the Buick, you know. And uh, I, I mean, they talked about the beach parties down at Lake Michigan in the 30s. It was around late 30s, 1940. I'm going to get these. I don't have time to read from them tonight. Dan Retzler's here, and he's an intimate part of that family. I got all this material from his mom, Joy, who was Thad Bauer's little sister. And Thad, unfortunately, died young, but he he wrote this stuff. And I'm, I'm going to get it scanned for the museum archives and then have a link to where you can read it uh, through there. It's going to take a while, but... I'm going to get Thad Bauer's papers scanned. So anyway, that was the New Philadelphia Bauer's uh, connection. They called it Parsons Paradise. They had a sign down one of the docks because all these houses in a row and a bunch of them were Parsons. Um, Uh-oh, what did I hit? I got a hit. How do I get back to slideshow? Larry, get me back to slideshow. I don't want to end the show. I got in in show. Now that won't work. Where's the one for that? I, I hit this down here somehow. That's going to end the show. That's going to end it. I want that. Hmm. Well, we'll have it in just a minute here. If you go to not full screen. How do we get full screen? I can't get the cursor back. That's all. Hmm. I don't see that. What did you say? I can't. Oh. We got to get a cursor. What there cursor? it is. Right, here we it is. found the cursor. Okay. Yeah. We are technological geniuses here of a certain age. This was Roy Bauer's cottage built in 1907 in this farmer's field. That, and I think the farmer was uh, John Lovendusky. That was Lovendusky's pasture land because it's straight down from his house. And in Thad's writings, he talks about the Lovenduskies cutting ice for him in the winter, putting it in the ice house. So they got this land from the Lovenduskies. This is a side view of the Roy Bowers place. Here's Roy and Clara in about 1907. Nice sunbonnet she's got. And this is our man, Thad Bowers, jaunty fellow he is. Got the cigarette, the white bucks, the whole thing. But it's, it's his writings you're going to get to read. And then Russell, the, the Thad's father, eventually built their house in about 1927. And here, kind of a do it yourself project. All the relatives get together and you start putting up boards. So, with that, I'm going to wind this up with a dramatic reading from our friend, Mr. Brown, who you remember is finishing up his two weeks at Platte Lake in 1901. And he's been going out and fishing every day for two weeks, rowing, 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 holding the silk line in his teeth with a big wobbling spoon in the back, hoping for the trophy muscle He's caught a bunch of other fish along the way. Cause you know, if you're rowing, but you, you don't have a hand for the pole. And hopefully you don't have dentures because if the fish hits, you're gonna lose them. So then he gives a diary of all his days. And finally, his last day. I'm making this diary entry on the railroad at nine at night. He had to go back to New York. Bitter loss. 
This morning I trolled up the south shore, no strike for two and a half miles, nothing doing. Had my lunch again on the point, loafed and watched the thunderstorm from the shelter on shore, caught a lot of rock bass, saw a giant fish. I know they're here. I'm rather tired of fishing for them and will try for trout and bass again. And then, where is it? <clears throat> Started for the boathouse by way of the curved shore of the cove, that would be Coambico Bay, trolling. This time I'm, a hundred, I'm on a snag for sure. No, a tremendous fish is jerking and taking line. It cuts my fingers. The boat is being dragged across the cove. I've been pulled 20 rods, fish very deep in the water. Comfort to know that the line is stout enough and the hook is very large, in fact, three of them. How can he jerk so? Boat going lively now. Fish goes under the bow, nearly fell out, passing the boat, the taut line around the front. At least 300 feet is out. Going to be the biggest fish ever got here. Pull on the line, 20 pounds, easy. All I can stand. Oh, for a big reel and stiff rod. Breath comes in gasps, can feel heart throb. Despair, line broken. No unkind fate. The fish is gone. With a hundred feet of line, never saw him. How could he be so mean? Paid five cents a foot for it. Warranted not to break. And it has broken. The rest of it tossed in the lake. It should have held a tarpon or a tuna, and here it fails with what was probably a 50 pound muscalunge. I'm going to leave at once. Never did like this place. Have tried so hard, and it does not give me a big fish. We'll never spend my vacation here again. I'm on my way back to New York. Never mind. Next year I will take a shark hook, a wire rope, and a windlass and go dredging for that fish. I can't stand it. I must have revenge. Or shall I or I shall feel bitter all my life about it. He is there in Platte yet. He can jerk on a line more viciously, meaner and harder than any fish I ever hooked not accepting a 23 pound salmon in the wild racing current. He made a gallant fight for life and won. Platt holds him. I hope no sportsman but myself will land him. And here in New York, looking back in all that lovely outing of 10 days, Platt lies fair in memory. May it continue to bring joy to its anglers, companionship for the whole souled Irishman who runs that little forest hotel and happiness to the good family. Next year, I'm going back to get that big fish. I don't believe it. One hour, I did it. <laughs> um, so, anyone want to make uh, comments or tell me something that I don't know? Yeah. I, wait a minute. I can't hear it. Can I give you this? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious who, you know, you started with uh, 1887 with the, the logging. Yeah. Who owned, where did the, is that who owned the land was the logging company? Yeah. And how did they get it? Do we know, do you know yeah. about that? Logging companies got leases on land from the government. The government owned all the land. They, they stole it from the Indians in the Treaty of 1836. And, 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 and logging companies could apply for uh, logging rights to huge tracts. They had what they called timber cruisers. These guys would go looking around, be out in the wilds for days, weeks, and they'd identify a good tract of timber 
and they rush to the patent office to uh, lay claim to it at the patent office. And that's how the lumber companies got their land. So when that was used up and the trees were gone, they just went away and abandoned it. Now the story is that that land of Edgewater, when they abandoned it, was bought by a mall mining company, I think from Detroit, not sure, who was going to mine marl out of Platte Lake, being a marl lake, never happened. And in 1916, John Spencer's father, Lou Spencer, who was, uh, I think, chief attorney for General Motors, uh, came up and bought the whole parcel, lock, stock, and barrel that was Edgewater and kept it that way in the family right almost to the present. He had two sons, uh, John and Robert, and they each built a humble little log cabin down by where the lake leaves, the uh, river leaves the lake. And the rest of it all out to M22, they just left wild uh, hunting territory. So that's how the Spencers got that huge tract of land. But anyway, Edgewater was never owned by the logging company. They just leased the, the logging rights. The government owned the land. Anyone else? Yeah. Information on what? Half Amadon? Um, not much. Uh, Half Amadon had a resort where the water wheel was. He had some log cabins originally. I, I, he had a portable sawmill back there at one time, I think, I've been told. Yeah, and he, you know, he developed, he had gasoline, uh, built docks down on the river, sold gas, rented boats, had this launch to bring you back up the river uh, and sold out to Bill Robinson, I think. Oh, okay, Packers. Oh, okay. And uh, then eventually, of course, it was sold to the park. But I, I don't know much about Half Amadon other than I've seen pictures of the resort and I know his mother and dad worked at Edgewater Mill. He had a real nice little cabin. I know what? Real nice little cabin on Oakdale. I don't know when that was built. Then they moved it across the river. Yeah. Well. Okay. I didn't know about that. I met a lady that was related to that there once, and she was going to come up in the summer and tell me some stuff, but I never got together with her. Yeah. Anyone know who owned at Sport and Soda, what they call it the Soda Park now, on the lower flat, there used to be a, a boat lift abandoned that was had a little covering on it. There was a cabin up there. This is 55 years ago. Does anybody know who owned that? Uncle F. Uncle F. Uh, yeah, Uncle F. That was, that was Uncle F's place. I <laughs> No, I don't have any idea. <laughs> Yes. Jerry, on the first point, I noticed there are, are some old apple trees. Was there an orchard there at one time? Oh, I'm sure there was. That was that was somebody's farm at one time. Uh, apple trees would be. Uh, let's see. There was some of the, some of the writings I'm going to put get scanned were by Virginia Allison recounting her days in the 20s. Uh, she stayed with the Amstutzes, but her family was out on Birch Point. And I think there was something in there about having bought their places from the farmer that had that. Uh, so, yeah, there was there would have been apple trees and that would have been a farm. The, the whole shore around the lake was somebody's farm at one and they were homesteaded. You know, they got the land for free from the government if they farmed it and improved it. And uh, yeah, it was all farms and all the cottage lots came from somebody's farm or from some lumber company's uh, land that they'd been given. Yeah. There's, there's a lab called Yukon Resort, but I don't know that there was ever a resort at Yukon. I've, I've not ever heard of one. 
Yeah. Many. And that for whom they mean. Who is Minnie? That was Uncle Ralph's wife. <laughs> yeah, I, every, I've asked that same question, and everyone else has too. The heck was, was Minnie? Brandy. Really? A Crawford? Yes. Well, I'll be there. Okay. Sally had, I once saw a picture of Sally of people with their car up there, you know, uh, having a picnic. People used to be able to drive up the, I can see traces of the old logging road up there. So Crawford's owned that property. They just named it. Okay, now you know Sally Casey's grandmother. That that was about many. Yeah, the the conservancy should know that. Anyone else? Yeah, Dan. Yeah. About the Bowerses and. Uh, in the early 70s, I got a traffic ticket and narrow gauge road. <laughs> Went before Judge Peter's Case. I believe he was about 87 years old. And I saw that my middle name was Bowers. He asked me if I was a local Bowers and no. And he said, are you related to those Bowers is out in Platte Lake? I said, yes. He says, when I was 17, I worked for the lumber company. And we, when we delivered lumber out there, the preachers on Platt Lake, they said the damnedest things of them hit their thumb with a hammer. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, we'll never be locals. You know, we may have been here all the time, but we'll never be locals. That's only the politicians and county officials are locals. Anyone else? Well, anyone want to hang around and talk? I'm here. And uh, I'll see what else I can dig up for new information for next time and look for those papers. I'm going to get them scanned. And uh, there's a lot of reminiscences in there. There's reminiscences from the Columbico original people and uh, a lot from Thad Bowers that tells you a lot about what life was like here. And I, I can't read it all. My dramatic voice is used up through the night. And we found out about Mount Mini. So. <laughs>